Good morning. This is the message for May the 8th, 2022. In our worship service today, we're going to sing four hymns as we normally do. And the reason we sing hymns is because they are so very well written. They have stood the test of hundreds of years, most of them. The theology is deep, and we learn really our emotional theology comes from singing hymns. Anything you sin, sing finds its way into your spirit in a way that just spoken words do not. And songs come out of your spirit uh, in a way that spoken words do not as well. So we'll sing these four hymns. The first one is Rejoice, You Pure in Heart. Rejoice, give thanks, and sing. Your festal banners wave aloft. Always to Christ your King is the theme. And then we'll sing, crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing. And those, that is a picture that is taken from Revelation, where all the nations and the kings laid their crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus, crowned him with many crowns. Then we will sing, Hail the day that sees, sees him rise. Also a good upbeat hymn, and we'll close with Rejoice, the Lord is King. So these are all about the kingship of our Lord Jesus. We remind ourselves of that because we are just very small, very helpless. We have no power. Everything we have is borrowed from God. And if we trust in God, the King, who has loved us with an everlasting love, then we will read four scriptures, Genesis 5, 21 to 24, which is a story about Enoch, and then Jude 14 and 15, which is a statement of Enoch quoted in the book of Jude. Then Romans 5, 12 to 21, and then Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. This is the theme for us where Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained this witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. For he had this testimony that he pleased God. Hebrews 9.27 previously has said that it is, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. In that statement, no exceptions are made. All of us have an appointment time to die, and we will keep that appointment. Unless you're still alive when Jesus returns to judge the earth and take believers home. Genesis established that death came into the world after sin and because of sin and as a penalty of sin. For God told Adam that the day he ate the forbidden fruit, he would surely die. And so the day he ate that fruit, death came into his body and he began to die. And though he lived over 900 years, he still died, and all his descendants have followed him in death because we are born with Adam's nature, and it is corrupt by sin. Genesis also underscores the truth by reciting after each man's life in the account of, of all the people in, in Genesis, and he died. As it says of Adam and Eve, and they died. Then after it gives the accounts of Cain and Abel and everybody else in the whole line, and he died. That repetitious phrase is given in Genesis to underline the truth of what God had said. The day that you eat, you will surely die. So in a short sentence or two, we move from Abel, the first man to die, to Enoch, the first man never to die. There are two men in Scripture who never died, Enoch and Elijah. Today we will not consider Elijah, but we will look at Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. 
he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we ask these questions. What made him pleasing to God? He was not a romantic figure as was David, the shepherd boy who defiantly faced Goliath, who took off Goliath's head in combat, David who slew his tens of thousands in battle. He was not a great leader as was Moses, hidden in the bulrushes at birth, raised in Pharaoh's house as a son to Pharaoh's daughter leading a million Israelites out of Egypt with miracles and signs and wonders for 40 years. No, Enoch was a man who lived a quiet life before God and man. He was not a king. He was not a great leader. As a matter of fact, he was just plain boring. Can a boring person please God? 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, some of my favorite verses say, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. When I read those verses and I think about American culture, everybody wants to be a rock star. There are so many musical programs on contests, American Idol, um, just tons of them popping up all the time, songwriting contests. And when the people are interviewed, almost without exception, they will say, I want to show the world who I am. I want to show people what I can do. That's a poison. The scripture says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of unbelievers, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Enoch was a man who led a quiet life, but also Enoch was a public man. He didn't live in seclusion in a monastery or off on a, as a hermit in the mountains. But he was engaged in business and the commerce of his day over a long period of time, many years, hundreds of years. He was a businessman who earned his living like other men of his time. I wonder, <clears throat> is it possible for a businessman in this world to buy and sell and enter into contracts, to live a godly life. I had a friend who said to me once, I have to make certain concessions every day that don't really add up with my being a Christian, but I have to do them anyway. That's the way business is. Is he right that it really isn't possible to live in a culture and do business in the culture and to live obediently to God? Is he right? No, our Lord Jesus himself engaged in business. Probably from the time he could hold a hammer and use a saw, he worked with his father. He was a carpenter himself. He had to deal with people who wanted to chisel him away on his prices. People who lied about things that they were broken when they were delivered, and they weren't delivered broken. Jesus knew what it was to deal with people always trying to scam him. He lived in a business in the business world, but Jesus maintained his holiness. We read of the apostles, all of them were businessmen, different businesses. A bunch of them were fishermen, toiling, struggling to make a living. And yet they were able to follow the Lord. They were able to live out their faith in God. They were men who were able to not cheat. Zacchaeus was a businessman. Zacchaeus was a tax a cheater, a tax collector. But once he met the Lord, he no longer did that. And he, he gave back to those from whom he had stolen. 
Is it possible to be a businessman, a businesswoman, and to still follow Christ? It most certainly is. And Enoch was a public man and was able to do that. He had faith, even though he engaged in the world's business. He was also a family man. He had a wife, sons, daughters, and all the attendant frustrations of being responsible for their education, their religion, their care and feeding. Times have not changed. It's always been hard to make a living. Now, you have to remember, too, they had no uh, indoor plumbing. They had no electricity or gas. They had no power tools. They were agrarian people. They scratched out a living from the dirt. They contended with uh, the weather, with drought, with insects, the whole thing. They had it, too. And this man maintained his faith as he took care of his family, which is a huge responsibility. One of the reasons why the Roman Catholic Church doesn't want its clergy to marry is because it wants them to be available to the church, to the congregations. And they know that a man who is married must pay attention to his wife and to his children. But there's a fallacy in that thinking. The thinking that he should not be married if he is a priest. Because God has commanded marriage and he said it's not good for man to be alone. And yes, men will struggle in, in, uh, to struggle to serve God as they are family men and take care of their children. Life is not easy for anybody. This man, Enoch, was a family man. So is it possible to walk with God and be a parent? To be a spouse? We don't know if his wife was even religious. We know he was. But we don't know anything about her. Were his children believers? We don't know about all his children. One we do, because Enoch was in the line of Jesus, so one of his offspring was also in the line of Jesus. But it is common that in many families there's a mix of believers and unbelievers. Can you live a life pleasing to God in your family? Enoch did, the apostles did, Jesus did. Millions before you say, why, of course, that's part of your service to God. So can you maintain your faith in your family? Of course. And then also, not only was he a public man and a family man, he was a witness for God's righteousness to the most evil culture around him. In Genesis 4.19, especially verse 23, we read about Lamech. Lamech was a descendant of Cain and Enoch. That is, and there was a different Enoch. He was, uh, Lamech was, excuse me, of Cain and Enoch. He was a descendant of Seth. He was a contemporary. Lamech killed a man and wrote a song about it. This is Genesis 4.19 and following. And he decreed vengeance. Anybody who tries to kill me, I'll avenge myself 77 times, which is greater than God's decree if anyone harmed Cain. Remember, Cain had been, uh, God had decreed no one should touch Cain. But Lamech says, anybody who touches me, I'll avenge him 77 times over. Lamech also started polygamy which was a deviation from one man with one woman as ordered in Genesis 1. Genesis 4.23, here's what Lamech said. Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. This man was profane and an evil man as was his ancestor, Cain. In Jude 14 and 15, we read these words. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against the Lord. Enoch prophesied 
and believed in the coming judgment. This prophecy reveals his faith in the return in the coming of the Lord to judge the earth in righteousness. Now we ask, where did he get that information? Well, he got it from Adam and Eve, who told them what God said in Genesis 3.15 and what God's provision had been. He got it from Abel first, and after he died, the faith was passed on through Seth and through Seth's lineage, right down. And so Enoch, being in the direct line of true believers, but living also side by side with very wicked men, Enoch's faith is strong. And he predicts the coming of the Lord to judge the earth. Matthew twenty five thirty one, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then in Matthew twenty five forty one. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And in verse 46, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Such a consistency between Enoch's prophecy and what Jesus says he came to do in his prophecy. The words are very close to each other. Mockers and ridiculers, godless men who deserved the coming of the wrath of God, surrounded Enoch. God soon afterward will send the great flood, the flood of Noah. For the wickedness of man was greater than at any time before or since. And in that culture, Enoch pleased God. He believed God. The question, if you're a student watching this, you're taking your studies in a high school or a secular university, even a Christian university, is it possible to walk with God in a public school or university where faith is ridiculed and scorned? Where the prophecies of the Bible are laughed at? Men, is it possible to walk with God in a culture saturated with pornography and immorality like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, where moral purity is disdained and immorality is encouraged as normal and desirable? Yes, it is possible to walk with God in those environments. There's never been a day as wicked as the day leading up to Noah's flood, and Enoch was right before that. But it always depends on you and how much you want God's approval rather than man's. Enoch had this testimony. He pleased God. How? By faith. By living. Like he believed it. Now I ask another question. Why did God take him? Bypassing the experience of dying. There's only one answer. And that's given in the text. For before he was taken... He was commended as one who pleased God. What does that mean? How can you please God? By faith. That's the whole point of the book of, of Hebrews and of the New Testament. The whole point of the gospel. Of Jesus coming and dying and rising again to the right hand of the Father. The whole point is that by faith we are justified before God. It pleases God. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Trusting God to be true. Believing that whatever God says is so, no matter what you see around you. And changing your life according to those truths. Jesus said, He who denies me before men in this generation, him will I deny before my Father in heaven when I come in the glory of my angels. Do you believe that? Then live like it. You belong to Christ. Your body belongs to Christ. Live like it. Your soul belongs to Christ. Live like it. 
Do not join in with men to do wicked things. If you're in business, you're in your home, you're a student, whatever you are, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Make him your master. Enoch practiced his faith. He lived for God's approval. That's the key, isn't it? To want God's approval more than the approval of man. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. John eleven twenty five and 26. If you believe that Jesus tells the truth, you will behave according to what he says. By faith, you will please God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Enoch was not said to be a perfect man, therefore he pleased God. He pleased God because he had faith. Abel pleased God because he brought a more acceptable sacrifice by faith. And now Enoch pleases God by faith. Do you have that faith? Let us pray. Our Father, sometimes the very simple things we stumble over. Teach us simply to be persuaded that what you have promised you are able to perform and you will perform. Not because we help you, we cannot. Not because you need us to do anything, you do not. But simply because you sent Christ into the world at just the right time. And he bore in himself our sins. And he poured out his blood for our redemption even the forgiveness of sins. And now he ascends it to your right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Lord, with Enoch and with the prophecy of Jesus, we ask that he would return quickly, return this day. Claim your own, judge the world. Have mercy, wonderful Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.